Let me just see real quick if I see Shep. Nope, not expecting to, but just wanted to check and see. All right, so welcome. Uh, I'm Brittany Whitmire with NC State Dairy Extension um, over in the Ag Econ Department. And my counterpart, who's above me on my Hollywood Square, Stephanie Ward, um, she's in animal science. And we're sort of stepping in on behalf of our UT leadership team that um, is the primary lead on this grant, Dr. Echelkamp. Uh, Liz Echelkamp from Tennessee. She's, I think, in an airport or on a plane headed out of the country today. And then the program manager, Shep Stearns, who many of you may have already had interactions with, um, he and his wife welcomed a new baby last week. So this is the rescheduled version of that info session and hopefully we'll cover a lot of the basics about this very exciting um, expansion of this program for our area. So we are recording. Cool. We're good to go. Um, and I will say, if anybody sees Ship, Stephanie or Dana, whomever, you know, we'll, we'll recognize him. But I don't, he, he's not obligated to be on today. So this is the the lead, lead group um, of us who are involved in this program from a grant management standpoint. Um, UT is the lead institution. So Liz Echelkamp and Shep Stearns are there. Stephanie Ward and I are at NC State, and Jennifer Hickerson, who I'm pretty sure I saw her a little bit ago, um, she's our primary contact in Kentucky. Um, originally, this SDBI IGRA, as many of you may know, um, was Tennessee only, and then in the second year of funding, they became a regional effort, and so Tennessee and um, Kentucky and North Carolina became the primary states, and then in subsequent years, we have um, been able to expand the region. And so today uh, you'll see an expanded map, I think on the next slide, that shows all 12 southeastern states plus Puerto Rico. That's that little dot to the right. Um, there are still, you know, the Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina people that you saw on that previous slide are still um, the main ones in terms of questions and technical process, et cetera. And we hope that those of you who are from all these other states shown in red that are eligible for this program, if you are in Extension or um, the State Department of Agriculture or any other type of organization that has regular interaction with your dairy farms in your state, we hope that you'll be interested in sort of serving as a conduit for farmers in your state and they, you can be sort of an initial contact for them because they're familiar with you, you know the area, you know the needs, you know the, the industry in your particular part of our region. Um, but with that, know that we have um, assigned those states that don't have a primary contact to either North Carolina, Kentucky, or Tennessee. So you'll note there, and if you're from one of those states, just kind of see which bold state is your primary contact. Uh, if you're a farmer in one of those states, we still encourage you to reach out to whoever you work with on a regular basis in your area um, and then have that person or y'all together reach out to us if there are specific questions. Um, there's some websites here. This slide will appear again at the end of the program, but um, these, if you get a screenshot of it, this, these are some links and some contact emails that may be useful in the future. Again, we'll see it again um, toward the end. All right, and I will go ahead and say I may. Um, I've got I'm fighting a little bug, so if I sound a little bit like Willie Nelson, I don't have his money or his braids, or anything else that he has. But um, just forgive me for sounding a little bit nasally today, and I may have to put you on pause and go hack a lung up. But I'll be right back. So thanks for that, and that's going to be on recording for everyone to hear. It's great. Um, okay, so. The thing that's most important and why y'all are here is that the, the program that has been the Southeast Dairy Business Innovation Initiative for the last couple of years, that has been his primarily focused, well, exclusively focused on dairy processing, either on farm or um, as farmstead or in, in general dairy processing. The scope has expanded and USDA um, last year made us aware that we were going to be allowed to have um, a greater variety of offerings this year in funding so that 
dairy farms that aren't doing value-added processing would be eligible to apply for. So that's why you're here. Um, and we're going to talk a lot more throughout today about what exactly that is, but the two categories that have been added, which are only for dairy farms. So if you're just dairy processing, the spring cycle does not apply. We will, as a note, for those of you that are farmstead and or involved in dairy processing off the farm, we will have another round of um, value-added specialized equipment and new business venture grants that will open up this summer. Um, but that's going to kind of be the late summer fall cycle that becomes a regular um, thing for SDBII. And then in the spring will be these programs that are focused on farm. And for this year, we have divided those into two categories. So farm infrastructure improvements and precision technology. Um, there's a website noted at the bottom. We'll navigate to that shortly, but um, these are very generic categories that can encompass a lot of things. And um, anyway, we'll, we'll delve more into them. The, the ticket will be that uh, here's, here's a little more detail about those programs. So for farm infrastructure um, applications, the maximum award is going to be up to $100,000. And that will also come with a 25% matching requirement. Um, and of course, if your project exceeds $125,000, uh, whatever that balance is will be out of your pocket too. So the maximum award is $100,000 no matter what. And 25% of the total project um, will be matching funds from you. The Precision Technology Investment Grant has a higher maximum, uh, same matching funds requirement. The important thing to note here is that you can pick one of these tracks. So as a farm, you can't apply in the same year for both an infrastructure improvement grant and a precision technology grant. That's disappointing, I know, but it's the rule. However, the good news is if you apply for say infrastructure this year and you get your project done, your money is spent, your contract is completed, you have met all the expectations. Then in next year's cycle, if there's something on the precision technology side that you're wanting to pursue, you would be able to apply for that. So you can apply for one at a time, but not both in a single cycle. And you will have to have a project completed before you can apply for um, a different project. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, on to the next one. And I think this is where, are we on eight? I think this is where I'm gonna hand it off to Stephanie, right? Sure. Um, so like Brittany said, I'm Stephanie Ward, I'm Dairy Extension Specialist at, here at NC State. And um, I uh, <clears throat> wanted to, I'm gonna go through what some of the, um, on the RFA, so the, the request for applications or proposals that you'll find on the DBI website, um, we have some bulleted um, items on each of these calls. Uh, and these are ones that we felt like um, as we went through and saw over the last couple of years that we've been working with Liz and the group at Tennessee and, and when we get these applications in from across the region, these were topic areas that came up a lot in conversation of these are things we need. And so when USDA um, decided to open the, these calls up beyond just value added production, um, we sort of categorized these into, into um, main ideas. But keep in mind that while these are what's listed on the application as potential areas, uh, you could apply for something that's not particularly listed here. Uh, and that's why Brittany was saying, um, if you know, if you have an idea outside of here or something that you don't see where it fits in some of these bulleted lists, then um, certainly reach out and we can have a discussion about that. <clears throat> so I, I won't read all these to you because I'm sure you, you guys can, can look through those, but they basically for the farm infrastructure improvement grants cover areas related to um, equipment on the farm, um, things that would improve uh, ventilation or cow cooling, um, increasing access to water and feed, um, anything related to waste and manure management um, are all uh, sort of included in here. And so just to give you an example of some of those things, um, I pulled just the cooling systems and ventilation 
to reduce heat stress part. There are a lot of different items that fall under that, um, and it depends on what your operation looks like. So it could be something as simple as um, converting from a standard box fan to one with baffles or a laminate or flow fan that moves air just a little bit more efficiently through your barn, or if you wanted to go all the way into tunnel ventilation, um, shade structures on grass operations, or um, for anybody that's housing cattle outdoors, these are two examples of of different types of those. So uh, all of those things could qualify. Um, the thing to remember is that a competitive application is going to have a good justification for what this piece of equipment or this project will do for your farm in terms of um, improving production or efficiency or fill in the blank. So for example, here, if we were talking about cooling systems, um, you know, we might see someone talk about if you are currently very seasonal in your milk production and maybe you've been given notice from your milk buyer that you need to get that um, down uh, into a, a reasonable range for them, um, that's a good metric to be able to include in your application. Uh, if, you, if you know or work with your co-op or whoever um, to sort of quantify what that seasonality looks like. And then you could offer that this change in in cooling systems or ventilation would reduce that seasonality. You would expect to see increased milk yields, better repro rates. All of those things would sort of be part of um, your application. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing that we'll talk about a little bit more later too, but I wanted to bring up here because it's just part of the example, um, is that there are opportunities to integrate into other grant programs. And um, the REAP program, which is the Rural Energy Program, is also has current uh, call open for proposals that deal with reduction of energy utilization on the farm. And so some of these cooling systems that upgrade or change might also fit well into the energy um, or into the REAP program. And so those are due, I think, at the end of March. So it has quite a bit sooner deadline on that. And there are some um, Pre, like some steps that you have to take for those, which Brittany will talk about later, but that is another cost share opportunity um, if you're thinking about going in, in that sort of direction. And we'll have time for, for questions um, later, but so two things that we've been asked a lot about um, as we've talked with producers and, and other folks um, about this new program is housing um, is one. And so again, um, all of that stuff can count. The rule is though, and what we want you to remember is that these are federal dollars. So two things that go along with that, there's no building or construction costs that could be included. There's no purchasing of land and really no what they would call capital investments that can be made um, with this money. And on that DBI website that Brittany mentioned, there is a list of allowable and unallowable expenses on there. And we'd encourage you to review that while you're working on your application. And we'll walk through those things with you if you need us to. Um, so no construction materials, but fans, waters, loops, if you're going into free stalls, those kinds of the things to sort of fill that barn. Um, if you wanted to upgrade things in your housing, um, thermostats to put your fans on, curtains, headlocks. Um, if you're working on packed barns, implements to manage the pack, um, all those things could be considered um, eligible for um, the, the infrastructure part of this uh, program. Um, then the other real common question that we get um, is parlors, and that comes across from both cows and the small ruminant side. Uh, and it, it's like, I mean, we feel a little bit like Santa Claus because it's kind of like Christmas. Um, that, yeah, that stuff, that stuff works. And um, robots, can, can be paid for with this. Um, if you're considering going in that direction, if you are, you know, um, milking some of our two teated friends over here uh, in, a, in a stall or stanchion and you want to modernize that parlor, then that equipment could also be considered part of this grant. Um, improving or expanding your current parlor, even if you're not moving towards automation or robotics, if you're, you know, in a double 10 and you want to expand to a double 24, the equipment part of that um, could certainly be included in this. The concrete and everything else that you would need to expand the maybe the footprint of the barn would be considered construction and that wouldn't um, be allowed. Um, milk meters, automatic takeoffs, 
um, any sort of upgrade uh, in that regard would also be something that could be considered eligible for this one. Um, and so then on the precision technology side, um, there's a, a separate list, but some are still kind of related. Um, any sort of wearable technology by the animal, um, any sort of pasture, forage, feed management related technology, um, equipment to support any automation. So for example, if you wanted to move into an automated calf feeding system, um, those, those systems, that equipment could be a qualified purchase. Um, so there's a list of things there. Um, the two things that I'll point out on both sides, um, too, that we don't often think of but are important pieces are business management improvements. And so whether you're value added or not, inventory control, um, upgrading your accounting systems, those kinds of things can also be a part of these grants. Um, so again, examples um, of those just to sort of get you thinking about them. These are examples of wearable technologies. So anything from cow manager to these are the, this is the all flex version of a ear tag and collars. These are just uh, pretty standard activity monitors I think are becoming relatively common um, on farms these days, but they still carry a price tag, especially if you're trying to outfit a large number of cows with them. Um, Milk metering, I mentioned that uh, on the infrastructure side, but if you were gonna move on to something like an AFI farm um, or AFI milk system, um, that might be more considered the precision technology side than it would be um, infrastructure. Um, and then under the feed management, forage management side of things, that's obviously a big part of any dairy operation, regardless of what you're milking. Um, feed management software, just again, we're not endorsing any one brand here, but just these are pictures <laughs> that I had available. So TMR tracker, um, automated feed pushers, all those sort of things um, can be included. So there's two things that we want you guys to think about as you're putting these things together. Um, and one is to make sure that the technology that you choose is actually gonna solve the problem that you have. And a lot of that comes from working with the service providers and vendors of this equipment or with your extension folks in your state. Um, and because these things are um, kind of, they're fun, they're, they're new and they're sort of innovative on the farm and they can get you a lot of information um, if they're used appropriately, but what we want to avoid is purchase of any of this kind of equipment or systems, and then it not actually following through with what you thought it would be. And so we'll talk a, a little bit later about the application process, but <clears throat> we'd really like to see that you've had a relationship with um, a vendor or service provider of these things before you jump off into you know, just buying a robot to milk your cows or any other um, big uh, in investment piece like that so that we know um, that it's going to work out for you in the end, right? A lot of the times, as some of these technologies started really coming on the market, we, we've we heard stories of uh, farms purchasing them and then realizing that they don't have the internet connectivity or the web base that they need to be able to make them work appropriately. And so, um, that's something that, you know, we want you to have that conversation up front um, while you're working on your application and not at the end of it if it's awarded. The other thing I think is important to think about where and it comes to technology is um, we often talk about technology as a replacement for labor, for human capital and, and human labor on the farm. And there are some ways that that is the case. I mean, we've put calf feeders in on one of our operations and they work great. Um, it's a whole different management style when you move into those systems, for sure. Um, but those robots only replace sort of the hands and the feet of our labor. They don't replace the eyesight and, and um, the other senses. So when you start thinking about some of these technologies, understand that you're going to get some labor savings from those in certain places, but you still sometimes need people to have eyes on animals. So again, just sort of thinking through and talking through with us, or again, like Brittany said, anybody which is normally an advisor for you, what's going to work um, the best. And then the other thing is to justify in your application how you anticipate that thing, whatever you're applying for, will improve or increase efficiency of production on your farm. And 
And it, it could be a very specific thing or it could be a general thing, right? We know that um, I think there's a lot of data, but also um, just real world experience with some of these wearable technologies now that we can do great in terms of heat detection um, and use less synchronization drugs, which is a cost savings over time. Um, so, you know, including sort of your thought process and the application is important for when that, uh, when you're talking about what you're going to apply for here. Um, a couple of things to go through. Again, there's a whole list of these, but these are the ones that we pull out because we think they're the most important for you to consider. Um, there are lists of unallowable costs, real estate purchases, land, none of that's allowed. Um, you can't use this money for repayment of loans or mortgages. Um, <clears throat> no rent, um, contract payments expend, that would extend beyond um, the life of the project. Um, you cannot pay for legal fees for things like someone to go to court and represent you. But if you are talking about farm transitioning and part of your business plan is to have legal consultation in that process, you can include those kinds of fees um, in your grant. No lobbying, fundraising, or other political activities, no purchases of vehicles. So those are sort of the, the big ones there. And then, like I said before, construction materials are generally um, an inallowable cost on these. Um, and so again, just to sort of strategize um, about your what makes a competitive proposal. Um, and you know, one, we, we sort of say, think beyond today. Um, it's really, really easy to walk across the farm and say, oh man, that's broke and this is broke and I need to replace these things. And the farm infrastructure grant could be um, a, a good place to start with that process, but to write a competitive application, you need to think about your justification for that, right? Um, if, you're, if your crowd gate hasn't worked or you've never had one and you don't have enough people to move cows during milking, then sh for sure you could apply for, for a crowd gate and that contributes to milking efficiency. And that's a bullet point on the infrastructure grant. So just sort of think through um, what's going to make you competitive. And I think we're all willing to help you do that um, if we start early, right? Um, there's limited funds. Every time we've done this, we get to the end of the money way before we get to the end of the applications. And that's pretty typical. Uh, with grant programs. So um, we want really good proposals put in. Um, I, and I don't want to say that and, and anyone feel intimidated or scared about that, but there, there's help out there and we'll help you get to that point and think through these things. But um, just to kind of give you an idea of what makes you competitive. Um, um, being strategic about what your investment is. Uh, applications that help you position yourself to be more competitive, right? Um, I mentioned seasonality before. We've heard that in the Southeast a lot from various sources that, you know, we have the seasonal swing in milk production and that just disrupts the whole supply chain. So um, thinking through what's going to make you more competitive as a, as a dairy business um, can also make your application more competitive. And then to the extent that you can, demonstrating what the returns are to the dairy, how will it impact your farm in terms of, it doesn't have to just be dollar amounts, but um, you know, we only have 60% of the labor force we've had over the last 10 years, or you know, some sort of thinking through it that way of um, this allows us to, you know, bring home another generation to the farm. I mean, there are some things that are not just dollars um, that make a difference and make you competitive and make your farm sustainable over a period of time. But if you can put a dollar amount to it, that certainly um, raises, uh, elevates the status of your application too. Um, so again, and I've said this a couple of times, start talking to somebody about your idea and doesn't have to be one of us on the team here, but we're happy to do that with you. Uh, most of you have a lot of extension folks, either at the county level or the university level in your areas. A lot of them are on this call um, today. And so they're, they're hearing our plea for help <laughs> as well with this, um, that you know they can help you think through that. There's also a lot of different um, service vendors and um, folks that sell the technology that have tech service available and field reps to you. And we've asked those folks as well. We are reaching out to 
um, a lot of the common um, folks we have in the region to consider being open to um, talking through these projects with you as well. And one important thing to remember um, for this, this cycle of the applications, it will require that you have some reference or a letter of support for someone that says, yeah, we've talked about this idea and we think this will work. And ideally that would be someone that knows your farm well, um, but it could also be uh, if you were gonna purchase um, wearable technologies, you know, a letter from that person or their, their field service person that says, yeah, this is gonna work on this farm. And this is what the, um, we've had these conversations and we can, we can meet these needs. Um, okay, so for, as far as timeline goes, um, the calls are open um, and they're due June 2nd. Um, if, if we get a request to review 65 applications on May 30th, that's probably not gonna happen. <laughs> so start early. Um, start now and thinking about what you want to do um, talk to the folks around you. A lot of you probably already have ideas about what you want to do and we know that you do because you've reached out and um, determine what's realistic and prioritize what you want. Like Brittany said, we're not encouraging people to apply to both of these at the same time, but pick one um, and think about what you can also achieve inside the project timeline, which is a year um, essentially from the time that your your contract is awarded until, um, you move forward in uh, into purchasing and ex all the other steps along the way there. Um, we've dealt with um, early on in this program, supply chain delays. This money came along um, really in the middle of COVID um, and prices doubled and tripled in, in some regard um, over 2020 to 2021 and even into 2022. Some of that seems to have flatlined a little bit um, over the last year or so, but <clears throat> we're aware of those things and we've tried to work with all of our applicants to, to make uh, concessions there where we can. The USDA is aware of that as well, but um, thinking through those things ahead of time will help uh, sort of head that stuff off at the end. So Brittany, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you to go through um, where to find this information. We will switch gears. Um, I may turn the chat over to you and or there may be some of those that we have to defer um, and get answers on, but I've tried to keep up with them. So do you want me to, sh do you want to navigate to these links or do you want me to do it from my end? What's the easiest? We were trying to be consistent so that the recording would be smooth sailing for people but um, we're going to talk logistics so uh, where to find this information Tennessee is the primary so for those of us in Kentucky and North Carolina and for those of you that are in extension or like I said in other sort of state level organizations who want to add information to your own websites um, we're we point back to this landing page so while North Carolina, we have a dairy extension portal and our folks sign up. And if you're from North Carolina and you're on this webinar and you already have not signed on to get our um, updates, we don't send you anything unless there's news. But from our dairy portal, you can sign up to sort of stay in touch and subscribe. And so anytime there's news about SDVII, we put that on our site. It goes out in an email and you can get to the main Tennessee value added dairy page through some of these other um, websites, but we all end up pointing back to this page so that it's all housed. So for those of you that wonder, you know, why is there a thing UT? Well, it's because they're the lead. So it's safe. You're not being redirected to the wrong website. Um, but this is what the landing page looks like. It's value added uh, dairy Tennessee. You can see it highlighted hopefully in the browser bar. If not, again, um, this recording as well as the slideshow will be available and the links are live on the PowerPoint slides. But this is where you can find um, all the grants. And Stephanie, if you'll highlight the drop down button under SDBII Business Grants at the top, um, there are actually four. So here's where I wanna make sure you're, we're, we're clear. Um, farm infrastructure improvement and precision technology and management, those are the two that are open currently. So those are for farms and for spring. 
The two below it, which say specialty equipment processing and beginning processor, those are the ones that have been out for two years now. They happened this past fall. Those happened simultaneously. We're housing all these grants here on this page, but don't be confused. They're all here, um, but the two you're looking at and that you're interested in are the top two. Um, and then at the bottom, of course, there's just a FAQ document that that's got some good questions and answers and we'll be adding to that, I'm sure. It's kind of a living document, but that's where you go to find if you're particularly interested in the infrastructure one or precision technology, go up to the top and click, on, each one has its own sort of pagelet under here. Um, so here we are on um, farm business grants. As you can see, this is, this is the 2023 spring cycle and precision tech and farm infrastructure are there. Um, all right, so I think the next thing we were gonna chat about is actually the application materials. So when you get to that landing page, toward the bottom of where Stephanie was, this is where your application materials are. Um, they're very you know, similar, et cetera, but you'll wanna click on the one Make sure you're on the page that's either for precision or um, infrastructure. And then the application load, well, I guess you can click on the RFP. The, the top link there is basically the description of the program. So it's going to be a document that's pretty long, but it's going to walk you through where this money came from, what it can be used for, who's eligible to apply, what it can and can't pay for, Here's the process, et cetera. So that's that's kind of the main document that if you got a question, there should be some information contained in here. That's where we'll go if you ask us a question. Um, and if it's one of these questions about is this allowable or not, there's a whole other document that gets real specific because it's federal funding. We'll point to that in a bit. But you can go back, Stephanie. That's 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 sort of the meat and potatoes of what is this grant. Um, so back on that page, when you scroll down to the application materials again, um, we'll, we'll actually click on the application itself. There we go. All right. And as a side note, you see that Stephanie's clicking on the links. I will say this, and this is quite important. Just to be reading the material, it's cool and kosher and all the good stuff to click on the link. But when you actually start wanting to put information that you care about and want to have saved, download the document. The little button you see she just pushed, it downloads because it won't necessarily save. It won't save. Let's just count on that it won't um, if you're doing it just online. So you're going to want to download the document once you decide and you think through long enough about what it is is the priority that you're going to put in an application for. You want to download that document and start putting data in that downloaded document. Um, all right. So, yeah, but we can see either the downloaded version or just the link to the application, Stephanie. Yep. Um, for those of you that participated in any of the value added cycles that we've had in the past, it's going to look very similar. Um, it's a fillable form. And so it it's going to go through who you are and, um, you know, what you're wanting to do. And there's some boxes you got to check in terms of eligibility, but um, there it's pretty straightforward. And um, we can walk all the way through this if you want to. I'm actually going to pull one up on my end so I'm not having to squint um, and look at it. The course section one, you know, got to be a U.S. licensed dairy business. Um, and the question did come up earlier. Well, actually, this is not totally the question, but this is, have you received any other assistance? So the Southeast Dairy Business Innovation Initiative has these grants, and that's like the icing on the cake, right? The grants are the really cool stuff. But we also offer educational programming. There's been conferences that we have held in all three states now um, that have focused on value added. Um, Stephanie and I will preview a flyer for three upcoming events in North Carolina that we're hosting that are focused on educational you know, offerings around this topic. We'll also talk about the grant and how it might apply. 
Um, we have a program that is uh, built into SDBII called Dairy Gauge, and it's intended to be a financial benchmarking. <clears throat> I'm sounding like Willie again. A financial benchmarking um, program, and we collect data, we beg to collect data um, from producers that's operating income and expenses and then balance sheet material. That gets um, submitted and I code it so that you know there's no name associated with the data that goes in. Um, but then UT, the folks that are managing that, Charlie Martinez and David Bilderback over at UT, they aggregate that data and then there's a report annually that comes out. And so if you have put data uh, as a farm, if you've allowed your data to go in, you will receive a report back that shows um, averages across the region, but also ranges and then where you are historically. So any of those types of services, if you've participated in any of these things, we like to know that. Um, and there may also be a place where, um, you know, I don't think it asks right here, but some the question was asked in the chat earlier is, you know, if you've received a grant in the past through SDBI, is that a negative or a positive? Um, at this point in time, it's it's neither. Now, in the future, there may be um, uh, a determined number, of, you know, like maximum number of awards that you can receive, et cetera. But, you know, in, in general sort of grantsmanship, if, if there's been investment in a project from outside funding, then oftentimes it's been vetted, you know, that there is an idea that more than one set of eyes have looked at it. So it doesn't necessarily give you points or lose points at this point in time, but you do want to disclose if you have been um, a recipient of funding for a project, it's, it's smart to include that. So don't try to think that it's gonna be a problem if you do. And then, you know, as you go through this application, you just, you're, you're gonna see, you will have already talked through this, hopefully with several people. As Stephanie mentioned, we really encourage you to work with whoever it is that you, you have as an advisory team regularly or someone from your co-op field staff that you, you know, you're comfortable talking to, um, extension in your state or your region, um, or, you know, maybe it's a supplier and you're learning more about the technology or the infrastructure that you're, you're wanting. But then you'll go in and the narrative in, in these applications, you'll boil it down to the, the critical points, but you're asked to give, you know, explanation of how, how it fits into this category. Um, on page three is where you talk about any other funding that you've received from SDBII. Um, on the project summary, which is in section two, reviewers, and this question was asked in the chat earlier and I, I addressed it, but in case you're not following the chat, we are not the reviewers. So Stephanie and Jennifer Hickerson and I, who are uh, some of the state leads, and Liz and Shep, we, we do not serve on the review committee. Um, the review committee consists of, and it, of course it changes depending on who's been recruited, um, but we target industry professionals who have been involved in the supply chain, you know, somewhere in the dairy industry. Some of them are retired. Some of them are still active. Um, there have been financial representatives who, you know, have worked in lending. Um, there's been technical service provider, et cetera. So those come from multiple states. There's at least um, historically, when it was only three states, there were two people from each state. So there will be a similar type of representation of diversity from um, the area as well as expertise. And it's a totally separate group of people. And that's so that we can answer your questions, you know, when you call. And it's not putting us in a situation where there's a conflict of interest. So anyway, they do like specificity, though, in, in these sections, whether it's on the timeline or the work plan. So as well thought out of <clears throat> a narrative and as much specifics as you can provide within the word limit, the better your application will be. Um, the other point, just as an overall rule, is these folks generally have a pretty good idea of the industry. And so asking for the moon and knowing you might only be able to lasso two stars, um, asking for something that's totally out of feasibility reach, whether it's timeline or um, market capacity or, you know, whatever, they'll pick that up. 
And so we've been advising folks put in a really realistic estimate, maybe best case, worst case, and then kind of right in the middle is somewhere where it's pretty realistic as to what these projects might do for your farm. But, you know, if, if, if you say you're, you got, you know, 150 cows and you're going to have 2,500 by the end of the year, it's not going to happen. And it, maybe it would happen, but in general, the reviewers really want to see something that has been well thought through, that's technically feasible, that's environmentally feasible, um, that you have the capacity to do from an HR standpoint, et cetera. So all of that feeds into here. Um, and on business fundamentals, this is where Stephanie mentioned, there's a lot of things that we can ask for in this grant. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of wiggle room, you know, in terms of what can qualify for um, infrastructure or precision technology, depending on what you need. The challenge is going to be we anticipate a lot of applications, more so than any we've had in the past because it's open. The eligibility, eligibility is wider. So that probably means the success rates can be lower in terms of the number of out of the total that get funded. The projects that get funded, I expect, will have a really strong section where they're saying, if I do this, then this is what we expect in return. And it'll be reasonable and it'll be feasible, but there will be a demonstrated return. And like Stephanie said, it doesn't ne necessarily have to equate to a dollar figure, um, although all of it will come back to economics in some manner of speaking. But if you got labor savings or it's an efficiency thing and you're able to use the same amount of labor, but they get this task done in less time and they can spend more time on X, Y, Z, that needs to come through in your application. And then this is just other stuff. So if if you've had previous grants or if you've had, um, you know, any anything else that might be important to your project, this is that interview question, you know, for a job that says, is there anything else we need to know about you that we haven't asked? That's that last section. Um, so keep on scrolling, Steph. All right, then we get to um, letters of support. So this year, this is going to be a little more um, involved in terms of, you know, oftentimes applications have come with letters of recommendation or letters of support or letters of commitment. These, because of the nature of um, the projects and, and partly the reviewers wanting to know that the idea has been vetted and that it's reasonable to expect that if you order, you know, these three things, your person that you're ordering them from has already told you, okay, there's expect at least six to eight months. You know, you've already had those conversations with people. That's where these letters of support are going to be pretty critical. <clears throat> and so when you submit a letter, we're required to have two this year. Um, those folks will actually receive a survey from the SDBII group to get to know a little bit more about how they're involved in your project, um, just to add some context to your application. So this is where, you know, work with the people that you know, um, that you're comfortable with, and or that are the experts in the field that you are getting into. So that's kind of a, a thing there. And on the budget form, there's a separate spreadsheet that um, you can click there and get. And I think it takes you right back there. Again, you'll want to download the form. And it's... Um, just line items of what is the item, how many units, how much does it cost, et cetera. And, you know, of course, if you're if you're buying something and it's coming out of your pocket, that's in your match and the amount you're requesting from the grant. One thing I'll say here that it's not necessarily on the slide, but it it, it kind of was asked about in one of the earlier questions is, you know, COVID is really gommed up the supply chain over the past few years and in some of our earlier rounds of funding on the value-added side of things people experienced this lag you know in in um getting equipment delivered etc so that's all been taken into consideration this year and so the rule still exists that only money spent within the period of this grant, so this upcoming grant period, um, which, you know, likely if these applications are due the 1st of June, they'll be reviewed 
it probably to say a month it'll you will be before we would know who's getting what um but anyway the contract has to be sort of signed on the dotted line for everybody and during that grant period is when however much money is spent on this project that's the allowable expenses now if you have to um for projects that are you know in play right now or maybe we've got people who are planning expansions or they're looking at significant pieces of equipment like a robot. Um, for, for this cycle, if there's something that's had to be ordered or a down payment's had to be made to, to kind of get in line because there's a 12 or 18 month wait period, um, that deposit can be made and that piece of equipment would still be eligible for these grants. However, the deposit that was paid outside of the grant period or the award period, it wouldn't count toward what you get, you could, count for your reimbursement for the grant, but money spent within the period can. So I hope that makes sense. That's an allowance that USDA has allowed us to, um, to make that sort of doesn't force everything into a grant timeline. Um, it does in a sense, because you still, you got to spend the money in the grant period. But if there's money that you've had to spend outside, it doesn't negate the eligibility of that particular equipment. Okay, so jumping over to um, other options, complementary funding. For those of you from states that um, aren't listed here that are in this region, if you have grant programs in your state that are specific to your folks, um, Tennessee has several uh, in that that they offer through their Department of Ag. Uh, we have three here in North Carolina that are run through extension through some of our tobacco funding, and then Kentucky's got a couple listed there. We would be happy to add those. If you send, those, send that information in to Shep or Liz, um, we can add those sources of funding that might be complementary to folks. Um, and on a national level, level, there are a couple that uh, I wanna reference here. Value added producer grant for any of you that are doing processing, you may be familiar with that one. Um, the cycle is currently closed, but it will open again. Um, probably, I think that's usually a fall application for a spring cycle. But anyway, that's that's funding focused on value added. The REAP grant, which Stephanie mentioned, um, has received a lot of attention this year because there's a higher max award and there's a higher percentage of cost share for those. The challenge on that is um, timing, but if you have a project that is really focused on efficiency or uh, renewable energy, et cetera, um, the REAP program does happen every year. It has a deadline this year for the grants of March 31st. Um, so this is a pretty tight timeline unless you're already got that in your, uh, uh, in your sort of toolbox, then it may not be applicable for this year, but in future years, I would keep that in mind because in talking to the USDA folks and there's a REAP lead in every state, um, that higher percentage and higher maximum will probably continue through um, the, se the next several years. So if you have a project that you're really focusing on saving energy and or creating renewable energy, REAP may be a really good option for um, adding to, um, you know, cost sharing your project. Okay, we got a slide specifically on um, REIT, but also VAPG, because another ticket that is important for you to go ahead and think about, and many of you may already have one of these, but um, anytime you get funding from a federal source, they require you to have what used to be called a DUNS number. Some of you may know that. Um, now they call it the unique entity ID. So a UEI, it's, it's a free process, but it takes a few weeks to get it done. Um, and I'm going to just go ahead and say that the, the website's not as user friendly as I would love for it to be. But um, anyway, SAM.gov is the website. And Stephanie, if you will pull up, we have added a quick fact sheet to our dairy portal. I think it will eventually be added to the um, landing page of UT. Yeah, that's the SAM.gov page. Um, and, and you get started on that green button. But if you'll go to our dairy portal, yep. All right, so on our dairy portal, which you might roll up to the top so they can see kind of what this looks like. 
If you click on value added resources in the red, and then you click again on value added resources and scroll down, you'll get to this page where we are. And I added this this week. Um, this quick start guide, this PDF, we found out just this week, thanks to Dana, um, who helps us with all of our accounting over there at UT. Um, on page three, it tells us that there's three processes for getting one of these UEIs. And depending on if you're like wanting to bid on federal contracts, et cetera, if you're just wanting it because you need it because you might receive a federal award, then you get to do like the easy form for taxes, right? So on page three, Stephanie, if you'll scroll down, um, you would be option three. So right here in this red box, you click that box once you go through the process and it basically lets you do the, the streamlined version of the form. Because all you need for our processes for SDBII or either of these other federal grants we've talked about or mentioned VAPG and REAP, you have to have that number, but you don't have to have like all the background for whether or not you might set up a contract uh, or make bids on federal projects. So hopefully that's a little nugget that if you're in the process of trying to do that for this year, it, it needs to be underway. But for next year, just know if you're if you're doing it to meet the minimum for receiving an award and don't have any plans to contract your services with the federal government, you can do number three and streamline. Okay. Um, the other thing about REAP is that in order to receive that energy efficiency funding or renewable energy, you've got to demonstrate that what you're wanting to do actually saves energy. So there's an audit that's required um, and several entities and a lot of uh, power providers, utilities provide these, but um, we don't need to spend too much time on that. Just know that those are sort of two preliminary things if you're looking for some of that external funding. And unfortunately, it's pretty tight this year. But for next year, um, keep that in mind. And we're going to try this fall to build some more programming that will help kind of identify and flesh out these federal programs that you might use in future years. So stay tuned, and we're going to try to do more of that in the future. Okay, I think that's it. On to, looks like there's plenty of chat going on and we will try to do our best to take some questions. I'm gonna say, um, Dana, if there's a process question and you're still on here that you think you can answer and or I'm flipping through here to see if I see Ship. If you happen to be on, um, feel free to interject, but if not, you know, we'll do our best to answer what questions we can and we're taking notes and we'll post answers to the questions that we can't answer as soon as we can. I did see a hand up a minute ago. I think it was Mallory. Mallory, you still have questions? You're welcome to come off mute and ask questions or if you want, your, you can also put them in the chat. Yeah, let's have some mayhem. I think Stephanie answered my question on can a contract heifer grower, somebody who's specifically <clears throat> producing heifers, apply for precision technology or infrastructure? And I think she said maybe need some clarification. Yeah, we'll go back in and um, either and probably have uh, Liz follow up with the USDA uh, <clears throat> person on that. It just comes down to how USDA defines the dairy business. And so we'll just get some clarification. But I, I would think, yes, they could could qualify. But Stephanie, this is H. Uh, a question here. I'm in with a group of several dairymen in Glasgow, Kentucky. Uh, how long does the grant last for? If you apply, how long do you have to get it finished? And you know, when does the second round come and things like that? Sure. Um, so do you mean if you get it, how long does it last for? Or do you mean how long is the application period? Uh, the application period closes June 2nd, right? That's that's right. So it's open now and closes June second. Um, we anticipate um, uh, awards being made and hopefully contracts signed um, by late July or August for this round. 
Um, and so once that contract is signed, that would start the the 12 month period. So roughly you would plan from August of 23 to August of 24 uh, for your, your grant period. Um, and uh, Brittany mentioned Dana, and I'm not sure if we introduced him or not, but <clears throat> Dana is, um, Dana Weber, if he, I'm not sure if he's still on here, but um, is at uh, Tennessee, and he is uh, Liz and Shep's, um, I would say, financial muscle, to be honest with you. So Dana is the person that you'll interact with if you are awarded a grant post-award to, to get all of your paperwork in order and get the contracts signed. And that takes, you know, some time. Um, and I guess the other thing we should mention um, about this and about these DBI programs in general is <clears throat> to remember that these are federal funds. So they're going to have restrictions on them, but they um, loosely <coughs> in the sense that we, the DBI group, um, are, are responsible for auditing these projects over their lifetime. Um, so if you do receive an award and you purchase equipment or any of the things that um, that, uh, that you include in your project, at some point we'll be coming to the farm um, or we'll, we'll work with your extension folks in your state just to make sure that things are on track um, that, you know, it's being used the way it's supposed to be used, um, and that you're, you're hopefully going to meet that year deadline. There are opportunities for extensions on timelines with things, because we know things happen, um, and usually that comes in a form of a request to SHEP, and then SHEP brings that before, um, our steering committee, uh, and we, we sort of discuss, um, approval of those things. Um, I'll say once a budget is approved, that is your budget amount. That doesn't change. So if you if you got $150,000 and $150,000 is what you're going to have to stay in. Um, but we recognize that costs can change from the time that you put your application in until the time that it's awarded. So we'll work with you to, you know, um, amend what your project looks like to keep you in that budget. Um, the next round H we're hoping will come out. So we'd like to get this one finished and the contracts done. And then the fall round would um, get opened up after that. And in the past, we've done that. Uh, you do, Annually, we have our um, value added SDBI dairy meeting uh, the last week of July. Um, and we try to have that <clears throat> second grant open usually by then or close thereafter. And those applications are typically due sometime around the first of October. And you may be asking, H, um, when is the next round of this particular farm side of grants? And we anticipate that again next spring, we will have another round of these precision technology and infrastructure grants. But as a reminder, and this addresses one of the questions in the chat, um, if you apply for infrastructure and you receive an infrastructure award this year, then you're not eligible for that next year. You kind of got to lay out a year, um, but you could be eligible for the other type of spring award, precision tech. So somebody asked if, the, if you only applied for 50,000 of the 100,000 limit, can you apply for the other 50 next year? And no, you can apply for infrastructure or precision technology in the spring. And then the next year, if you finished and closed out your one grant, you could apply for the other kind. So, and at this point in time, there's 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 not a limit. I expect that there will be just because there will be a volume of applications. But um, hopefully that may be addressed part of what also you might have been asking, H. Thank you. Um, there was a question about um, new versus refurbished or used equipment. Dana, are you on here? Yes, I am. You have an answer to that question? We actually did have one dairy producer in this current round uh, that had decided to purchase off of eBay. Now, while that's not really recommended, we understand that there are some situations where for whatever reason, the product is just impossible to locate. Otherwise, we have to get approval through the USDA contact that we have 
And in this particular case, when the dairy producer approached us, we were able to get uh, a yes on that. But before you decide to do that, if it is an item that it is simply impossible to locate, definitely connect with us and ask us in advance before you decide to purchase. Uh, that would also apply if you're doing what is called a down payment setup, where instead of paying for whatever you're purchasing 100%, you're just asked to put a down payment down on it. Um, that's what I've been told to sort of use as a guideline. And that's what I'm using currently. Okay. So hopefully that helps. And a lot of these questions are, you know, if they get real specific um, into what can be, you know, can can a project with soil and water line up with it with this? Um, it's going to depend on a lot of factors, and those may be more case by case. We we tried to hit as many of the general sort of we can't do construction, we can't do this or that. Um, there's also a little bit of a nuance between federal dollars matching federal dollars. So um, that's another it depends situation. But um, anyway, anybody else got some sort of process or overarching questions? Some of these that are super specific to, you know, a single project might need to be discussed with, you know, your state person and or somebody just to talk through the idea to see if it's even going to be one that ends up fleshing out. But Hey, Brittany. Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. I asked you in the question, the chat part, but I had one. So, okay. So Stephanie just answered it because I have had one. Yeah, I'm trying to catch ask, up to all the questions. <laughs> I had one farmer ask, that they are, they're unique in the fact that they have a herd share side and also a commercial, but I have a feeling they're leaning more towards going straight herd share. And they asked if they could apply for this as well. Yeah, it's um, it, it's not really designed to support raw milk sales. Um, and they, you do have to be, a, you know, a, a dairy business entity to apply. And for this particular round, like Brittany said, that's got to be um, a farm. So straight processors wouldn't qualify uh, for this one. Um, <clears throat> and um, I, I will add the caveat to that because we went through this on the value added side and, and we probably need to get some more clarification on it. If a dairy is currently not grade A, and applied to this for equipment to move in that direction um, or to, to go from grade B to grade A, then that could be part of the infrastructure program. There's a, I, did, I do see a question. I don't think it, I think we missed it. If you've already answered it and I missed your answer, Stephanie, sorry, but somebody asked how long does it take reimbursement? Um, if, if you're awarded one of these, um, the good news is you're not in round one. So. <laughs> Your your reimbursements don't take as long as the folks who were in the very first round of this that ever got going because you know it's all second place is like in the marketplace not in a race you're you're better off because somebody else has already jumped all the hurdles. Um, but Dana might be able to answer this question better than me, but it's it's been pretty quick turnaround. Um, Dana, can you answer that question in just in general, how quickly you've been able to process those reimbursements provided that you get all the appropriate receipts, et cetera, to prove payment? If, uh, if I have all of the appropriate receipts and that would be a bank statement, if it's a personal check or a cashier's check, if I also have a credit card statement, if you're purchasing it by credit card, those would be your proof of payment for whatever it is you're buying. But the invoice from your supplier is critical that it meets specific standards because I have dealt with quite a few vendors currently and have learned quite a bit as to what they're willing to do and what they can do when they create your invoice. 
it's it's imperative that before the actual item is invoiced that you make sure from your supplier that they understand a sales quote is not going to do it a sales order will not do it it has to literally say invoice and i know that some suppliers try to cut costs by just using a sales quote or a sales order that can actually add additional days on to getting your reimbursement pushed through as a general rule i can normally get you within 30 days or less it just depends on when you purchase the item because the date that you're going to see if it's on a bank statement, say that you bought something on December 31st, you're just now getting around to submitting it here in March. Our accounting department is going to be looking at that date on your bank statement as to when your bank transferred money to the supplier's account. And that's the date that's used. And in each of the cases with our dairy producers, they normally have a net 30 turnaround. Well, if you purchased it at the end of December and it's now March, you've well exceeded the 30 days. So in that case, you're probably looking at about a one to two week turnaround. Um, the only exception might be when we come into the what is the end of the month, sometimes our accounting department gets a little bogged down with the typical end, end of month reporting. And that could delay it maybe a couple of days. But generally, what the date that you see on your bank statement when the fund transfers to your supplier, that's the date that you can then walk. 30 days ahead, and that would be when you should receive your funds. So as, as Brittany is saying, it's basically a case-by-case -case basis, and I would have to literally see the invoice to tell you what kind of a turnaround. So hopefully that helps. <coughs> I've got one question I was hoping to ask somebody. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. I can, sure. Okay. Um, I'm curious too. I, I think the infrastructure will let you do some energy efficient things. But my question is, you know, because there's always limited funds and so forth. But if you're looking at doing energy efficient things, are you better to go to your electric service suppliers see what type of grants they have so you can use the other money to do other things you need or is this a very good way to look at energy efficient things like as simple as even buying a more efficient washer and dryer or something like that for doing towels and everything it always makes sense to use other people's money so um to answer your question, I guess, if you've got a contact with your utility company, you're correct that oftentimes they have incentive programs for um, efficiency investments or efficiency improvement investments. So if you know, if, if you want to explore that option um, to see that you could pay for X, Y, and Z, and then you could use this money for something else, then that's probably a smart thing to do. Um, you might also look at it in the framework of, um, you know, if you're if you're doing the same project and it's not federal dollars that are competing against each other, it might potentially be able to be used as your match. What's coming out of your pocket because you got to pay that twenty five percent against the SDBII money. But in terms of how to spread the wealth of of OPM as people call it, other people's money, sure. If you think there might be other outlets um, to target some of the things you want to do, explore them. You you got between now and June to figure out what's the best use of, of these funds, I would say um, the main thing you want to remember is these are going to be super competitive. So the, the, the most bang for the buck 
that comes through in an application in that narrative is is probably going to rise to the top. So if if there's an investment that you can make, and um, you know you know how much savings it's going to create, or if your utility company is willing to send out someone to do an energy audit to compare what you use now versus what you know if you're putting smart sensors on fans or if you're in, installing variable rate motors, you know, whatever it is, if there's a significant difference in inter energy usage, that might be part of what you put in this application to say, if I do, if I spend this money, I'm gonna have this much savings. So sometimes the utility will pay for the audit or help pay for the audit. And then that might be the justification that you use for a grant. Um, but yeah, I'd encourage you anywhere there's potential um, to, to, to do that, figure out as much as you can uh, between now and when this deadline comes about, but make sure you're, make sure you're not waiting till the last minute to pour everything into this application, but very good point. Thanks for bringing it up. There's a, another question here in the chat. Um, I think it's an important one to point out is how long is the follow-up period um, on awarded projects? So basically how long is, um, is the U.S. Uh -huh. involved? And that's <clears throat> technically for the life of the equipment um, that they're involved. And another good point to think about is technically with these things, uh, the USDA, uh, and Dana, correct me if the contracts have changed, but I believe they still would own the equipment. Um, and really what that means is they have, they retain first right of refusal. So if you um, bought robots and put them in and you got three years down the road and you decided this is not for you, um, <clears throat> Hopefully it wouldn't take you three years to figure that out, but if you did uh, and you you decide to tear them out and sell them, then the USDA is going to, you have to notify them. You have to go through us, notify them that that's what's going to happen, and then they would let you know um, what they want you to do with that. Now, realistically, is the USDA going to come to your place and pick up your um, your feed pusher? that's five years old? Probably not. Are they going to ask you for the $10,000 you might get back for it? Probably not. Um, but if you ended up with, you know, really large uh, projects or something along these lines, then then that might be a different story. So so the answer to the question um, for, for Mallory is it's for the life of whatever equipment you would purchase. Well, it's for the life until its depreciable value is less than $5,000. So for large equipment, yeah, it's basically it's lifetime. But for some of these smaller purchases, that may be pretty soon, you know. That would be correct from what I understand as well, too. So are you going to have to have a legal mortgage prepared, uh, you know, to say that this is USDA equipment? I think it's built, I mean, it goes in your name, but I think it's built into the contract, Dana, you may know specifically more about that. It, and, and like Stephanie said, they won't own it, but they will retain a first right of refusal. From, from what I understand uh, from our Office of Sponsored Programs, uh, Brittany is correct. Um, I know that once it hits a value of $5,000 or less, then I don't believe the USDA is interested. It's when it still is valued above that amount, then there is a legal discussion at that point. So I think the answer to that H is no, but it is in the contract that you guys, that awardees would sign that they recognize, you know, that that's a clause on the purchase. That would be correct from what I understand as well. Any other questions from anybody? Um, I assume this falls under, you know, cow comfort and some things. What about trying to control birds and so forth within your facility? What things fall under that or not, to your knowledge? <laughs> well, you can't purchase firearms or ammunition. <laughs> well, I'm thinking some of this new laser stuff they have out there 
they're using out in California and so forth to help uh, uh, keep the birds at bay a little bit and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I think I would um, I would encourage you to. I'm unfamiliar with that. I'll start with that. Um, but those kinds of things are a good discussion point to start with your local person. Um, you know, and send in some resources on what that what those things look like. Um, and then we can we can sort of think through where that might fit. Hey there, I had a question. I see uh, nothing really allowed for construction or concrete, but if we were looking for like bedding storage, would a hoop building be allowed being as it's not a temporary structure or is that considered construction? Yeah, that's that's probably still going to be construction. Any Anything from moving dirt, that's considered construction to, um, you know, actually constructing or buying materials that are construction materials. That's very likely not eligible. I mean, we can ask the specific question, but it's going to be considered construction. I'm about 99% sure. Could you think of a way to store bedding that would be allowed? That's up to you, yo. <laughs> no. uh, I think, yeah, we may come, let us come back around to that one. Uh, we may ask, let us ask for clarification on that. Um, I mean, even containers in the last round, we ran into yeah. we ran into answers of no. And I tried every which way to say that a container could be picked up and moved and, you know, could be considered not a real property improvement. But USDA did not approve those. So um, we, we'll we'll think on that. And I encourage you to think on that with your people, Brady, I guess it. That's how you're showing up on here. I don't know which which state are you in? Kentucky. Okay. H, you be thinking on that. Maybe we can come up with something that would work. Go ahead. Repeat the question, please. <laughs> trying to figure out a way to make bedding <laughs> storage eligible under this program. I mean, I don't know. Is that something soil and water? Does that fall in there? If you can connect it to some sort of uh, waste management issue, digging a well. I think that's going to be considered a real property improvement. Mallory's asking about digging a well. We can ask. It might be that the uh, pump and some of the pieces you know, could be eligible, but the actual cost to drill it wouldn't be. We'll have to ask. Real anything that had that smells of a real property imp improvement, um, usually hits a sticking point as construction or ineligible as a not a something you could pick up and take away. We'll ask. We do have we we have Caitlin on here from UT who is helping collate and collect all your questions and anything we hadn't gotten and or that we've answered incorrectly or that we need to get an answer to. Um, we'll have that and post it somehow or another to you. Anybody else got anything? I really appreciate your thoughtfulness and your willingness to. Um, same answer on the pivots. We will inquire. Yeah, pr probably on both of those questions, the, the pump might get covered and the pivot itself might get covered, but the digging part most likely would not be covered. Um, so so you guys have the, the links to the application. Um, you'll see some emails going around. Um, we're trying to collect uh, information from people as, as you register for these things. So we've, we're collecting that and um, you'll see some some more stuff coming out from us. We do have uh, uh, some 
workshops coming up over the next month or so here in North Carolina. Um, and and um, more details will be going out about those, but certainly anybody's welcome to attend. Um, our first one will be March 17th in Canton at the Western North Carolina Livestock Center. Um, and then <clears throat> uh, we'll meet again April 6th at the Piedmont Research Station in Salisbury and then April 25th at the Chatham County Ag Center um, in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. And the goals of those are to sort of talk through um, precision technologies and um, what, you know, making the right decision for for your operation. Um, we'll talk a little bit about modernizing your milking system. So some of the topics that we'll cover at each of these will fit into um, the areas that are um, covered in these RFPs. Uh, and I'll make the note again that <clears throat> um, just looking across the names here, I know we've got a lot of cow folks um, on the call, but our the goats and sheep and um, would also qualify for this, and, and we'd encourage those applications as well. And I guess if you're milking something outside of cows and goats and sheep, you might want to give us a call first. Make sure the <laughs> technology works for those. So, I know we've got some water buffalo, and I've heard rumors of camels, so that one we'd have to have to figure out what you're going to have. So um, this that flyer will go out to our list serves and it'll go out to the Tennessee Dairy Discuss. Um, for those of you that are in Tennessee, uh, attending that meeting in Canton, any of them really, I think, but specifically the one that's close there to y'all in the Eastern end of the state um, will count for Tennessee Master Dairy Credit according to Liz. So um, we'll be on the lookout for, for announcements about those. All right, I think we've uh, taken up your full lunch hour. So if y'all don't have anything else, we'll sign off and and uh, we look forward to hearing from you and receiving your applications. <laughs>